I've called this lecture the New Age Agenda, but it deals with actually more than just the New Age Agenda. The field is so vast, you cannot really cover it by breaking it up into little components. So basically all we're doing is we're creating puzzle pieces and putting them together eventually to form the whole picture of a total onslaught on Jesus Christ as sole Savior and also particularly the divinity of Jesus Christ. Well, who is behind the New Age movement? Once again, sad to say, but the same power seems to be everywhere. Behind the scenes, scenes like a web, like a spider's web, covering every base. A man attributed more than any other with steering the New, Ma New Age movement is a man by the name of Teilhard de Chardin. Now, who was Teilhard de Chardin? Well, you should guess it by now. A Jesuit priest. <laughs> Teilhard dreamed of humanity merging into God and each realizing his own godhood at the Omega point. This belief has inspired many of today's New Age leaders. Everyone has a quote. Every statement I make has a quote. I never say anything. In fact, Chardin is one of the most frequently quoted writers by leading New Age occultists. So the Jesuit movement, again, working stealthfully behind the scenes. De Chardin himself wrote, a general convergence of religions upon a universal Christ who satisfies them all. You see? How fascinating. That seems to me the only possible conversion of the world and the only form in which a religion of the future can be conceived. So once again, if we're going to set up a Luciferian system, and we saw that the Jesuit organization using Freemasonry has lifted up Lucifer to godhood and renegade or degraded Jesus Christ. Once again, they're looking for a universal Christ that satisfies them all, but they do not want Jesus Christ. Because that is exclusivity. The secrets of the Gnostics, all these New Age writings, are steeped in Gnosticism, which remove Jesus as the focal point and replace him with Lucifer or man as the final deity. You had the Ebionites, the Marcionites, the Gnostics, and the Thomasines, all of them basically teaching that Jesus was just a mere mortal and that we, in a sense, are divine and the divinity of Christ is only to be reckoned with in the same terms as we are divine. Behind the scenes, the Roman Catholic Church is controlling occultism at every single level. It even has specialized bishops like these wandering bishops who deal with the occult worlds. This is a man by the name of Don Bosco, and he had a vision, a Roman Catholic visionary, he had a vision in 1862, where he claimed that he saw the gospel ship land between the two pillars of the faith. In other words, anchoring the gospel ship between the two pillars of the faith. And the two pillars were, number one, the larger pillar, the Eucharist which meant that Jesus Christ had been sacrificed again and again and again and again. Actually, the Eucharist, which symbolizes the death on a daily basis through the Mass, in fact, on an hourly, by-the-minute basis, as they have worked it out, ensures that Christ remains crucified, dead, crucified, dead, crucified, dead. It is the body of Christ. In actual fact, the Eucharist then is the ultimate celebration of the victory of Lucifer over Christ. And the second pillar, which they claim is smaller, has on it Mary, which simply means that Jesus has been replaced by another mediator. 
So that is actually what this vision means. Of course, in Catholic terms, it means the acceptance of the Eucharist and Mary by the entire world. Now we must remember that in occultism, Mary can be both male and female. So whether you put a female deity there, Mary, Isis, Ashtoreth, whoever you want to put there, or whether you put the male equivalent makes no difference because he's androgenic. So you could put Apollo there, the face of Apollo, you could put Osiris there, you could put any one of them. It would be exactly the same thing because Blavatsky says they're one and the same. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 to 6. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Is it so that God has said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fr fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That was the original battle in Eden. Question. God had said you will surely die. The serpent had said you will surely not die. One of them is lying. Correct? One of them is lying. If you are surely dead, then you are a created being and certainly not God. And here the serpent says, in fact, if you eat of it, you'll realize that you are actually gods. Another lie. These are the twin lies of Eden, told by the serpent. Of course, Freemasonry teaches that it was the other way around. That it was the devil, as we saw, who told the truth, and that Yahweh, he's the liar. That's what we saw in all those Freemason quotes, so they turn it upside down. This is therefore central Jesuit teaching because the Jesuits actually form masonry. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, there's the old appetite problem coming in, and that it was pleasing to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make wise. That was the big problem there. She took of the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Good. That was the battle in Eden. If that was the beginning, then the end will be the same. The same victory that the serpent got in the beginning, he will try to claim at the end as well. So starting with Mary Baker Eddy, there she is, the founder of the Christian Science Movement, we're starting to get organizations which give themselves Christian labels, but which teach everything which is not Christian. This is a very clever move. Not everybody is duped by it, but because the name Christian is associated with it, that means it must at least have Christian values, right? Wrong. She writes in Science and Health with Keys to the Scriptures, which was voted one of the 75 books by women whose words have changed the world by the USA's Women's National Book Association. So this is very influential work. One of the 75 books written by women to change the world? Amazing. Now, what did Mary Baker Eddy have to say? Here are some statements. Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures which this religious movement uses as a document in addition to the Bible. Evil has no reality. It is neither person, place, nor thing, but simply a belief, an illusion of material sense. Page 71. Well, I always ask myself the question, what planet did she live on? Certainly not this one. Jesus, the highest human corporeal concept of the divine idea, rebuking and destroying error and bringing to light man's immortality. Page 589. Okay, so Jesus is just an example to show us that we are immortal. But didn't God say you will surely die? Didn't he say that? 
Yes, he did. But she says, no, man is immortal. Let us remember that harmonious and immortal man has existed forever. Page 302. The Bible says he's a created being, man. But she says, no, he's immortal. He has existed forever. Death, it's an illusion. The lie of life in matter, any material evidence of death is false for it contradicts the spiritual fact of being. Page 584. Okay, there is no death. Who said you will surely not die? The serpent said so. The soul is the divine principle of man and never sins, hence the immortality of the soul. Ooh, that's a very fascinating doctrine. So we are two entities, a shell that dies, a soul that is immortal, and that inner being never sins. You know, that is a Gnostic teaching which uh, the Nicolaitans also liked, which the Bible says God hates. That this body is a shell, so therefore what you do in the body doesn't really matter. You can eat whatever you like, you can stuff yourself, you can fornicate, you can do whatever you like. Who cares? You're going to just drop the shell and carry on immor immortally. God said, it is given for man once to die, and thereafter the judgment. That's a totally different story. So this is definitely not biblical. And it sounds very much like serpent language. She writes, Man and women as coexistent eternal with God forever reflecting in glorified equality the infinite Father-Mother God. That's an androgenic God we have here. And this sounds more like Lucifer than it sounds like God. And this Father-Mother God concept is not biblical. Otherwise it would have said, our parent who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But it doesn't, does it? No, it says our father who art in heaven. So there's the one movement that gives itself a Christian name. Here's another movement that gives itself a Christian name, the Mormon movement. The Mormons call themselves the Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ. So this is Jesus Christ's name being used again. And the information comes from this angel over there, who is the angel Moroni. I don't want to make a pun with that name. Anyway, here he stands on top of the globe, blowing his trumpet. Here is a typical Mormon church. It has no windows, just like Masonic lodges don't have any windows. And the founder of the Mormon movement is none other than Joseph Smith. And Joseph Smith was a 33 degree Freemason. What does that tell you? Who was his God? If he was a 33 Freemason, degree Freemason, then his God was Lucifer. Now, this is his follower, he's uh, the next prophet, if you like, the Mormon leader, Brigham Young, who followed up Joseph Smith. And he happened to be a 33 degree Freemason. Well, let's check this out. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormonism, its founder, Joseph Smith, was a high-level Freemason. His successor, Brigham Young, was also another high Freemason. According to the book Black Robe, Brigham Young was an intimate friend, friend of Peter de Smet, one of the most powerful American Jesuits of the 19th century. Oh, we find them everywhere. But they're never in the front row, they're always in the back row, so that they never get bonks, the others get bonks. Well, here Joseph receives from the angel Moroni the gold tablets with this new doctrine on it. Now let's ask him himself whether what I'm saying is correct, so it's always good to go to his own writings, his history of the church, in the evening I received the first degree in Freemasonry in the Nauvoo Lodge, assembled in my general business office. I was with the Masonic Lodge and rose to the sublime degree. There you have it, straight from the horse's mouth. It cannot be denied, Mormonism was started by Freemasonry under the control of who? The Jesuits, yes. Now, what would be their principal move to start an organization that controls one whole state at least in the United States 
and together with Freemasonry controls the entire space program. Because anybody who's ever been in space is either a Freemason or he is a Mormon, one of the two. Very interesting. Not only that, they are the organization which have the greatest database on anyone ever living. They will find out everything from who you are, who your parents are, where you live, what you did, every single thing about you, they have the database. This is a database that will be important one day when it comes to buying and selling and who's going to get what in the new dispensation. So they perform a very important work for the Jesuit order. If you look at uh, Mormonism, they have the same sort of ritual as Freemasonry, they have their aprons, the handshakes are a little bit different as you see, they have their secret handshakes and all the paraphernalia that goes along with it, and this is their main temple at Salt Lake City. Again, you can see, it's a pretty shut up place, and uh, and when you go and look there, you'll see the all-seeing eye with the Masonic uh, handshake in it. You'll see the moon and the Baal Haddad symbol and the sun and the upside-down pentagrams. Former witch, Mason, Mormon, and Satanist Bill Schnurbelin emphasized that to the magician, the inverted pentagram has one use only, and that is to call up the power of Satan and bring the kingdom of the devil into manifestation on earth. So here is the symbol right on the Masonic temple. I took these pictures myself, so I know they're there. Uh, another quote, you will find the satanic pentagram invaluable and indispensable if you attempt to, attempt to draw from the infernal power of our Lord Satan. This extremely powerful amulet is the sign of the microcosm and is the summation of all occult forces. In other words, there is no amulet or talisman more powerful or even close to as powerful as the satanic pentagram. It's interesting that it's on virtually every flag in the world, which is just another story. So if we look at uh, the Mormon temple, we will find them in their upside down form relatively frequently. All these symbols are all over the Mormon temple. The all-seeing eye over there, down there, symbols of the sun, they have circles. Originally they even had the dot in the middle, but they've become a little bit more um, clandestine and have removed those. Uh, on their other churches at the same site you will find the Star of David. All of these features are in Mormonism. Here the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood. They claim that they have the priesthood of Aaron. Now, by the way, that is a blasphemy because who has become the high priest forever? Jesus. This means they are taking upon themselves something that belongs to someone else. They are robbing Jesus Christ of his role and his authority. Kathy Burns, Masonic and Occult Symbols Illustrated says, both Masonry and Mormonism refer to the Melchizedek priesthood. In Scottish Rite Masonry, the 19th degree is called the Grand Pontiff. It is during this cer ceremony that the candidate is anointed with oil, made and proclaimed a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. I thought there was only one who was of that order today. Isn't that so? So both of them, Mormonism and Freemasonry, do this. Hebrews 5, 5, 9 tells us, however, that Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but was called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But occultists, Mormons, Masons glorify themselves and take on themselves the honor of priesthood that was given to Christ alone. So when we titled the series Total onslaught, you can see that every aspect of the world out there is designed to rob Jesus of his power and his priesthood. This is the choir room, if you like, of the Mormon tabernacle. This is where the Mormon choir sings. 
And who has not been moved by this choir? It is the most magnificent music that you can imagine. And they are world famous for their music. But if you realize that in Satanism you can call him Christ too, because Jesus means Joshua, Joshua means Yahweh, the Savior, and Lucifer claims the same title. So you can sing these beautiful songs to another spirit, depending on whom you are obeying. So many of these poor Mormons, of course, have no idea, because again, in Mormonism there are degrees, and you get initiated into higher and higher levels. So the lower levels know absolutely nothing. These poor little nun girls that walk around there, showing the people around, saying these wonderful things that they have read and not realizing what they're even saying. If you look here at the Mormon uh, structures there, I mean, wow, it is impressive. Money was obviously not an object. What about Mormon doctrine? Let's have a look at that quickly. Section 27, Doctrine of Covenants, verse 11. Mormons, Mormons teach that Adam was God. Journal of Discourses, Volume 4, this is their official writing. That some sins are atoned for by own blood only. What does that tell you? Well, that's not biblical. The Book of Mormon, Alma 7, verse 10 says, Jesus was born in Jerusalem. That's not biblical. It's minor, but it's just irritating. Journal of Discourses, Volume 2, page 81 says, Christ was married to Mary, Martha, and others. Well, that'll give you a good reason to have a little bit of, um, you know, more than one wife. Why not? They deny the atonement. We're going through the same ritual again. One of the most pernicious doctrines ever advocated by man is the doctrine of justification by faith alone, which has entered into the hearts of millions since the days of the so-called Reformation. Joseph Fielding Smith, this is Joseph Smith himself writing, The Restoration of All Things, page 192. Well, doesn't that sound similar to what Westcott and Hort had to say, yes or no? Well, this is Masonic teaching, and Mormonism is nothing other than a front for Freemasonry, masquerading as a religion of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Mormon book in 2 Nefti 2, 22 to 25 says, Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. So Adam fell so that men may have joy? That's interesting. Actually, this is part of a sex cult. It gets kind of perverse once you go into the details, and I wouldn't even want to discuss what happens in some higher echelons. Let's not even go there. The fact of the matter is enough to say that if a Mormon dies, he has a lot of vestal virgins up there to keep him occupied on the other side, and their deity is married to literally thousands and thousands and millions of female spirit beings and does nothing but fornicate from morning till night to produce the souls that are to enter into men to create men. It's a pretty disgusting doctrine, really, in the secret regions. Sterling W. Sill, member of the first quorum of 70, stated in the church section of Desert News, July 31, 65, under Christ, Adam yet stands as head. Adam fell, but he fell in the right direction. He fell towards the goal. Adam fell, but he fell upward. Jesus says to us, come up higher. Uh-huh. So this is typically serpent language. When you fall, you will gather what? Wisdom. You will become like God. You will go up, not down. Brigham Young says, The devil told the truth about Godhead. I do not blame Mother Eve. I would not have her miseating eating the forbidden fruit for anything. Through the gift of sin, humanity can achieve Godhood. Well, who's this speaking? Is this the devil speaking or is this Jesus Christ speaking? This is in their doctrine of covenants. You were also in the beginning with the Father. Man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence or light or truth was not created or mad, neither indeed can be. Again, you have it there. Mormonism is nothing other than Freemasonry, masquerading as a religion of Jesus Christ, deceiving millions in the process, and just being a tool for the Jesuit order. 
The Catholic Mass basically says the same. O oh, blessed fault which does procure such a Redeemer. This is the figure of Christ that they have at the Mormon temple. And uh, whether Jesus looked like that or not, who knows? The devil says he wants to impersonate Jesus. So maybe Jesus looked like that. I don't know. I'll find out one day when he comes with the clouds of heaven. I wonder whether he did have a split beard, which is a symbol of a goat, but nevertheless. Here we have the leader, Joseph Smith. And if you look at uh, the figures over here, you'll see a beehive. And uh, if you go and look in the book Two Babylons, you'll see that the beehive is a symbol of paganism. This is pagan deities. Now, this is a rather fascinating story. You see, the world is being controlled by occultists. And occultists often run in families. So you have occult families which control the world. Now some people go too far and they say, you know, there's a reptilian connection and there are reptile families. And ooh, Have you heard of those stories before? Now let's not go there. Let's just say, is it possible that there are families that control the world? And uh, they come from royal families. Now some royal lines have been eradicated, eliminated, destroyed, wiped off the face of the earth through Jesuit intrigue, and others have been placed in power, like the House of Stuart, for example, in England. Every one of them high masons, those are all occultists. I mean, the queen is the queen of the Bilderbergers. How much more occult can you become than that? So here you have these royal families, is it possible that these royal families are controlling much of the world and that the kings of the world will one day rule? Well, let's just have a look at something interesting. Here is the Howland family chart, which is published at the Mormon temple and tells us who's who in the zoo and who's related to this family. One family, so we're looking at great-great-grandpa. Let's have a look who his descendants are. One family. You can check this out for yourself. Joseph Ira Earl, very prominent man in his old days. Joseph Smith, there's the founder of the Mormon movement. He is part of that family. He comes from the same great-great-grandfather. Emma Hale comes from that family. Winston Churchill, he has the same great-great-great-grandfather. Franklin D. Roosevelt has the same great-great-great-grandfather. Uh, Richard Nixon has the same great-great-great-grandfather. Do you mean to tell me that President Ford had the same great-great-great-grandfather? Do you mean to tell me that George W. Bush Sr. had the same great-great-great-grandfather? George W. Bush Jr. had the same great-great-great-grandfather? Now, this is kind of strange. Do you really believe that though they come from different sides of the of the earth's divide, that they all come from the same family? Do you think this is pure chance? I leave it to your speculation. I don't want to go further into this. I just find it fascinating that they all come from the same family. From Churchill to how many presidents in the United States? One, two, three, the one in between four, five presidents in the United States, plus those from the other side, plus the founder of the Mormon movement, all from the same family. Very weird, very weird. And then if you go into Mormons and NASA, you will find that all the top men, they were all Mormons or they were um, Masons. If you go into a Mason temple, you will find the photographs of the presidents and you will find the photographs of all the great stars that went up into the sky. Here is the Scottish Rite Supreme Council Northern Masonic Jurisdiction Calendar, their own calendar from 1998. And it tells you some few interesting things. Anybody recognize that man? Buzz? Aldrin? Anybody recognize that one? Colonel John Glenn? And they tell us what they were, 33 degree Freemasons. So the lists are just endless. We've already discussed that every single president just about as being a Freemason, and you'll find them in the Masonic presidential lists. So Freemasonry 
is also behind the New Age movement. Here you have the original magazine, Freemason magazine, which was called the New Age. But because they linked it too much to Freemasonry, they changed the name to uh, Scottish Rites. Now, so many people have said to me that I surely do not have the books I'm talking about. I'm pulling it out of my thumb. So I took the trouble to put them down on the white carpet and to photograph them. There is um, Pike's book, Morals and Dogma. There is Blavatsky's book, Secret Doctrine, Secret Doctrine, New Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, a whole host of them. Now people tell me I just photographed them from somewhere else and I'll put them on the carpet. So next time we'll photograph them, I'll put them in my teeth and in my hands and between my toes. I'll do whatever it takes. I really have these books. Here is Alice A. Bailey, the high priestess and prophetess of the New Age movement. Remember that she received messages from the Tibetan Dwal Kul. We introduced her when we spoke about Freemasonry. Leviticus 19.31 says, Do not turn to mediums and spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, Hebrews 9, 17. Let's just get these voices and these verses clear. When these voices come, are they contrary to the verse? Probably yes. This woman has written more books than most other women in the last two centuries. One of the most prolific writers of all times, Alice A. Bailey, her books were published under the symbol of the lotus flower and they were published by the publishing company Lucifer Publishing Company which caused such a stir that they changed it to Lucis Trust. Now there's only one other woman that has written as much in our century. Did you know that? Or in the last two centuries. There are only two women who even can compete on this issue. The one is Alice A. Bailey, and the other one I will introduce to you in another lecture. So contemplate that, a nice row of books, and remember there's another writer who wrote probably more even than this. One of the books, Problems of Humanity, with the Masonic signs on it, Reappearance of the Christ. This is a preparation for the coming of Christ. Forgetting the things that lie behind, I will strive towards my higher spiritual possibilities I dedicate myself anew to the service of the coming one and will do all I can to prepare men's minds and hearts for that event. I have no other life intention. This is Alice A. Bailey writing. Now this coming one is not Jesus Christ because she's a Luciferian. Who is she saying is going to come? Lucifer, but they call him the Christ. Now, which other movement is waiting for the Christ to come? The Mormon movement, right? They're saying he will come and he will present himself in their temple there in Salt Lake City. Here's another movement that might interest you, the Jehovah's Witnesses. And there are millions and millions of Jehovah's Witnesses in the world today. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses were formed by C.T. Russell, who lived between 1852 and 1916. He's the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses. They vehemently deny any Masonic connections, but this man was a 33-degree Freemason. It's getting kind of boring by now, isn't it? Getting kind of boring. Well, let's have a look and see what we can dig up. The Divine Plan of the Ages, the helping hand for Bible students, here it is in uh, the Norwegian language. Notice the symbol that they use on the front is the symbol of the god Ra, the sun god Ra, the equivalent of the god Shamash. Here is an original uh, watchtower from December 1, 1916. This is no longer deniable. There it is. I photographed it myself. And there it is, the symbol that Freemasonry uses. There's the Masonic symbol on it. And then he describes here how um, the founder, Russell, died. Here's a perfect description by his companion. 
he, it was then that he stood again and said, please make me a Roman toga. Make me a Roman toga. He was dying and he made him a Roman toga from a sheet that he put in him. I did not understand what he meant, but did not like to have him repeat because he was so weak. His voice had become so weak that he had to repeat nearly everything. Uh, Dear Brother Russell, I do not like to ask you to repeat anything, etc., etc. I said, Brother Russell, I do not understand what you mean. I will show you. And then he took the sheet and he took it round him, etc., etc., fastened them together here. This is how a high mason wants to die when he gets to the point of death. So the entire Masonic ritual, the high Masonic ritual of death, is here described. So Russell was a high Freemason, a 33 degree Freemason, whether we like it or whether we don't. So this is an occult society pretending to represent Jehovah, Yahweh. If you look at his grave, you will see that it also had the Masonic symbol in the wreath on it, and the early watchtowers also used this symbolism. There it is, and there it is. You'll find it on the early watchtowers. You need to have very old ones. I got this information from a Jehovah's Witness who turned from Jehovah's Witness in his old age. So, if we look at the, the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses, they are the organizations that have made more f predictions of prophecy than any other, and every single one of their prophets, this is the chart of the ages, every single one of them has turned up zero. For example, 1874, they said, was the coming of Christ. He never came. 1878, the resurrection, they then taught that had taken place, but were invisible. 1881, close of favor to the Gentiles. Probation closed. 1914, Armageddon didn't come. 1915, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were to be resurrected. They were not resurrected. 1918, Christendom and its churches would be destroyed. Didn't happen. 1920, the republics uh, did not disappear, as they had said. 1925, the establishment of the kingdom. Well, if this is the kingdom, they can have it. After 1925, people would be able to call up Abraham, who would live in Jerusalem, and have their loved ones resurrected. Nothing of that happened. The New World Bible came out in 1950. Before that, they just crossed out the King James Bible. 1975, the end of the world, but it did not come. Not one single prediction. One of the things that the Bible says about a prophet, a true prophet, is if his predictions do not come true, then forget about it. End of the Gentile times, page 99, Jehovah's Witnesses. Concerning the times of the Gentiles, we consider it an established truth that the final end of the kingdoms of the world and of the full establishment of the kingdom of God will be accomplished by the end of A.D. 1914. Nothing happened. Sometime before the end of A.D. 1914, the last member of the body of Christ will be glorified. Did it happen? No. Otherwise, how can they still make Jehovah's Witnesses today? Uh, it would be a kind of a waste of time, right? End of Gentile Times, page 77. Now, one of the features of occult organizations that pretend to be something else is that they use subliminals. Subliminals is something that you hide within a picture to show that you really are demonic or not. They use it in movies, they use it in soundtracks, they use it in all kinds of stuff. It's an occult way of doing things. And normally they do things upside down and all kinds of interesting things. So if you go to the old watchtowers and you have a look at them, you will often find demonic faces or uh, Masonic rituals hidden in the pictures. So for example, this angel on the land and the sea representing Christ, he has these folds in the hand, if you look carefully, you'll see it's a demonic face. The raising up of this young man is the same handshake that is used to raise up Hiram Abif in the Masonic ritual. It's uh, the lion's grip, if you like. So that is Masonic, and you'll also notice that the finger was offset to one side in that picture, and we'll see this relatively frequently. 
If you look at this rather unassuming picture in the watchtower over here, and you take a little bit of a closer look, you'll see that in the knot of the tree, you have the head of the goat. There are the horns, there are the eyes, there's the skull, so you have the symbol of the goat hanging over them. If you look at this man over here, he looks pretty innocuous. If you turn him upside down and you look carefully, you'll see the demonic face in his hair. Now you might think this is chance. Well, let's continue. Here the, the angel over here, again with the offset finger. The keys they are using is the Roman key, and you will find many S's in their garbs and in their clothes, symbols of Lucifer. And this picture is so full of Masonic symbolism, it's just not true. Uh, the angel over here has hosts of Masonic symbols in it. And over here, you have a subliminal. I don't know whether you can see the subliminal. Can you see the subliminal in the woman's dress? Can you see something over there that doesn't look quite right? Yeah. All right, let's make it a little bit bigger. Let's see what we can come up with. Take a careful look. You really have to look well. A subliminal is not something that you're supposed to see. And another thing about a subliminal, some see it instantly and others don't. This is a face of a man. Can you see it? Yeah. All right, some can see it clearly. There's a nose, there's a moustache, there's a this, and the hair seems kind of strange. Now, who is that? Is that just any face or is it someone in particular? Let me give you a, a face on the right. Do you recognize him? Do you recognize? There's the beard. There's the nose, there's the hair. That is this individual over here. Who's he? That's Zeus. So they put all the subliminals in it. And some people will see it. Who can see it? Let me see. There are lots that see it. Okay, great. Some just cannot see it. That's the nature of a subliminal. Now, if we go to the other one, you will see over there Masonic triangles. You will see uh, over there you'll see pentagrams, all kinds of things hidden. And then they will use shadows and do it so cleverly, this is supposedly Jesus, of course they give Jesus here a different look to the Mormons, they give him short hair. Uh, notice that his foot is a goat's foot as a shadow. So these are subliminals that they use. Again here, if you look at the garbs, you can see the S's and the folds, all kinds of things that they use. So this religion, again, a religion started by Freemasonry because the, the idea is the more distractions you have, the more likely you are to cover all the bases. Doesn't that make sense? And what is the aim of all these religions? To remove the deity of Jesus Christ. That's the aim of all these religions. They teach, for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses, that Jesus is not God. He's just a created being. Mormonism teaches that. Freemasonry teaches that. The occult world teaches that. Islam teaches that. Insider Catholicism teaches that. They all teach that. Somebody hates Jesus Christ. Can you guess who it is? It was Lucifer, yes. It was Lucifer. And his agent, the Bible says, is the papacy. And they're going to use the papacy to achieve its ends. And I think it is high time that the world is shown the nature and the magnitude of the total onslaught against Jesus Christ as Lord, Savior, and only Savior on this planet. We have seen that part of the New Age agenda is to create as many organizations as possible that deny the divinity of Christ. Now, if you're going to cover all bases, you also have to reach those people who are not easily churched. This organization over here is the Baha'i organization. Haifa Israel, June 2003, nearly 
One and a half million people have visited the garden terrace surrounding the shrine of the Bab on Mount Carmel. The Bab. This is where he lives. Or where he <laughs> is represented. He doesn't live there, of course, anymore. Since they were first opened to the public in 4th June 2001. On Carmel, they put this temple. Here you have the temple representation, you will see all the symbols again, the stars and all that goes along with it. And the Baha'i faith says the fundamental unity of all religions is its main aim. And, well, Tailat de Shadin says we must get them all to accept a universal Christ that satisfies them all. The independent investigation of truth, the equality of men and women, the elimination of prejudice, universal education, establishment of international auxiliary language, spiritual solutions to economic problems, the harmony of science and religion, attainment of world peace through international cooperation. So powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate, I hate these words, I'm totally allergic to these occult words, the whole world. Right, so they want to get all the religions together under one star and... Uh, that star is definitely not my God. The Golden Dawn, Israel, there you have the symbol of the New Age. Part of the New Age is mystic revelations. The teachings of the Christ, two pillars, Yachim, Boaz, then came Taurus the bull, Aries the ram, uh, Buddha, Sri Krishna, Sankara Shiva. We have the age of Piscis, which brought us the Christ, and then eventually we will go to the universal Christ. This is New Age theology, and it starts, of course, with Yachim and Boaz, which is the very heart and soul of Freemasonry. Again, Freemasonry controls all these things. The musical hair, when the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars, then peace will guide the planets and love will steer the stars. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abounding, no more falsehood or division. Golden living, dreams of vision, mystical crystal revelation, and the mind's true liberation. Aquarius, Aquarius, Aquarius. The old people will remember that tune, won't they? Yes. What a lie! Everything about this is Luciferian. It's the coming together in unity under occult symbols, just as Freemasonry does the same thing with its Yachim and Boaz symbols. The Bible doesn't talk about pillars in that sense. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are the ones who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. Those are pillars that we can put our faith on. I think that is the only thing. So the New Age is full of amulets and cosmic keys and pyramid power and astrology, and natural healing, hands of light. It's all very esoteric and very pleasing to the mind this wisdom, this ancient wisdom, the Enochian workbook, archetypes of the tree of life. By the way, the Enochian workbook is, of course, apocryphal, which Roman Catholicism teaches perfectly acceptable. Tarot, magic, all-seeing eyes, pentagrams, witchcraft, either good witchcraft, dark witchcraft. Do you know that in England, you can take a degree at the university in witchcraft and the government pays for it. It's nice. You can become a witch. And you can choose to become a dark witch or a good witch, a white little witch or a black little witch. It doesn't really matter. Once within the magic circle, the witch says the following word, Great masters of the universe, swiftly execute my wishes. I summon you by the great names full of power of the Illuminati of the firmament. This is calling Lucifer. Appear to me as I evoke the sacred influence of all the principalities and powers. I thought we battle against them. Here they invite them. Do you come in peace through the power of the exalted Illuminati? Will you serve me and reveal all things unto me of land and sea, of knowledge and wisdom, of good and bad, of natural law and of sorcery? That's what witchcraft is about. Can you see the language of Eden in there? Yes or no? Yes, good and evil and all these things. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 18.10, There shall not be found amongst you 
anyone that makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire or that uses divination or an observer of times or an enchanter, a witch, a charmer, a consulter of familiar spirits, a wizard or a necromancer, one who speaks with the dead. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. Today the world, this is what it's about, this is the world. Voices from heaven, archetypes of the zodiac. Now let's have a look at some of these great modern channels that communicate with the spirits. Uh, the channel, Virginia Seen, she says Jesus speaks through her. He says death is the creation of humanity, not of God. This is the simple truth. Again, they teach there is no death. Here is a New Age book, The Life of Death. Here's another one by Yan Kuri, You Cannot Die. Then it has the symbol of Shamash over there. You cannot die. Is this serpent language or God language? Sure, it's serpent language. Ecclesiastes 9, 5 to 6. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Ecclesiastic 9 verse 6. When you're dead, your mind ceases. But now these people, they talk to them. Living tarot, spiritualism, personal alchemy. The rose is a symbol of Lucifer. Ancient magic and the new age. They use the same symbols. They use pillars. There is the half moon with the star in it or the sun in it. That's the same as the birth of the sun god and his death. And if it's in the form of the host, then it's the Eucharist, if you like. They have the face of Apollo instead of Mary. It's just the male form. It's exactly the same thing. So sun, moon, stars, Isis, Horus, Set worship. Another channel is Jay-Z Knight from New York. She's probably the most famous channel in the world today. She talks to a spirit called Ramta. She has all the famous film stars as her clients. There she is. She's a very pretty woman. And uh, uh, this is, by the way, Masonic, but never mind. There is her symbolism. And you'll see that it's triangular and all these things. Ramta, channeled by Jay-Z Knight. Throughout history, we have tried many different avenues to remind you of your greatness your power and the foreverness of your life. We have been king, conqueror, crucified Christ, teacher, friend, philosopher, anything that would permit knowledge to occur. At times we have intervened in your affairs to keep you from annihilating yourself so that life here would continue to provide a playground for your experiences and your evolution into joy. Nice. Remember that Mormons also teach that man sinned so that we could have joy. This is Jay-Z Knight. We'll turn the sound down. I'll just show you a brief uh, picture of her, of her talking. The sound is not very good. Here she explains how she met Ramta. And she said, Ramta appeared to her as glittering light, as someone who takes a handful of glitter and throws it into a sun ray. And she looked at him and he says, she said to him, Who are you? You are so beautiful. And he said, I am Ramta. I've come to help you over the ditch. Fascinating. So, here is an interesting one. Let's her, let her talk for herself. The sound is not very good, but listen to what she says. We cannot become nearer to God in giving our power away to a concept that there was only one Son of God, for it begs the question, then who are you? All right, we cannot give ourselves over to the concept that there is only one Son of God because it begs the question, then who are you? What does that imply? That you are also God. Okay. Let's ask her now to tell us what her true faith is. Let's listen to what she has to say. Listen carefully. What is the good news? The good news is the thing that the church calls blasphemous. That the only way we can explain common people to be divine is if they were God. 
and it's the one teaching they forbade anyone to have. There is only one place that God is explained in his most extraordinary and simple concept, and that isn't the church. It happens to be the nemesis of the church. It's called science. Well, then comes a big lot of rock and what have you. So, what don't they want you to know? That you are God. The church does not want you to know that you are God. But the nemesis of the church is going to be science. Fortunately, science is going to destroy the church. Is science doing a good job of that? Very good job. False science, so-called. Amazing teachings. So, sometimes you have to have a little bit of help to go to the other side, so they use drugs. Here are uh, smart drinks. This one is called Fallen Angel. It's sold in a packet of 100% G's no, no Jesus. And you can perk up your spiritual life by using ecstasy. And if you have been on ecstasy and you take a smart drink, a normal one, whatever it is, uh, do you have Red Bull here? Gives you wings and all these drinks with a high caffeine. Just that can trigger it again and give you another trip. The New Age also teaches us how to become divine and controls others. In the business world, breakthrough performance, here is a young man walking over the coals, which the Bible forbids, which is also done in Hinduism, which teaches you to become divine and achieve results through focused attention. You can look at someone and make him do whatever it is you want him to do. One of these young men came to me and he says, I can make you do anything I want you to do. And I said to him, you can make me do nothing that my God will not permit. Helen Shookman, she started hearing an inaudible voice which dictated messages to her. This continued seven years. She wrote the Course in Miracles. Three startling months preceded the actual writing. So there she goes. She writes the book. Why me? Because you wish to know the true me are willing to serve and have given me permission to enter your life. And so the messages went on. And then finally she wrote what the Spirit dictated to her. Jesus Christ, what's her first statement? There is no need for help to enter heaven, for you have never left. Can you see the total onslaught on the divinity and vicarious death of Jesus Christ and Him as the only Savior? This is a total onslaught. And then come the various chants where well, you say, I'm not a body, I'm free, for I'm still as God created me. In other words, this eternal life aspect, the course is the beginning and not the end. And when you go through this course, pain is my own idea, idea, it is not the thought of God. I call upon God's name and my own. This is blasphemy of the highest degree. There is no death, she writes, because the Son of God is like His Father. You know, they give all these pathetic reasons. It's not even logic. Nothing you can do can change eternal love. Forget your dreams of sin and guilt. But what does the Bible say? It's because of sin that Jesus had to come and die for us. Is that right? Yes. So if we are to forget those things because there is no death, well, then you can carry on as you did before. Scientology teaches you to become clear. All it is is a scientific way of new age. You attach yourself to emitters, lie detectors, and they go into all your most personal details, and eventually you end up going when you lie about something, and so they clear you. It's a form of confessional, and then you are so relieved that you float and become God. Magic and the Western mind. The keynote of the New World Religion is divine approach. Draw near to Him, and He will draw near to you. And there's a hierarchy the new world religion will be the unifying of the great divine approaches. All religions coming together. So if we look at the doctrine, the New Age versus the Bible, the Bible says Jesus is the Son of God, the New Age says Jesus is one of the Masters. The Bible says you are saved by grace, the New Age says you achieve Godhood through works. The Bible says Jesus is the only way, and the New Age says the white Christ, Christ consciousness within. The Bible says Lucifer is the devil, the New Age says Lucifer is the true Son of God. 
The Bible says worship God. The New Age says worship the creation. The Bible says man was created. The New Age says physical man evolved. Spiritual man always existed. The Bible said God is not part of the creation. The, Bible say, the New Age says it, it is pantheism or panentheism sometimes if they want a divine Lucifer still to appear to them. It gets a little bit more complicated. The Bible teaches the resurrection. The New Age teaches reincarnation. The word is truth, says the Bible. The New Age says truth is within. And the Bible says wait for the second coming. And the New Age says wait for Maitreya. Bible says turn from sin. New Age says there is no sin. Forget. The Bible says become Christ-like through sanctification. The New Age says discover the power within. Mother Teresa, who was a great New Age proponent, says, Oh, I hope I am converting. I don't mean what you think. If coming face to face with God, we accept Him through our lives, then we are converting. We become a better Hindu, a better Muslim, a better Catholic, a better whatever we are. What approach would I, would I use? Well, for me, naturally, it would be Catholic. For you, it might be Hindu. For someone else, Buddhist, according to one's conscience. What God is in your mind, you must accept. Is this biblical doctrine, yes or no? No. This is serpent doctrine. This is not biblical doctrine. So a Roman Catholic priest might as well be a Buddhist. And they can. They are Buddhists. We must merge the ethical and the practical, the political and the priest. That's the theme of their conferences. So the Runcies and the Koenigs, these are the Catholic theologians and the uh, Church of England, Dalai Lama, Muslims, Jews, Sheikhs, all of them come together. And at the United Nations of Faith, they were ready to move mountains. And they rehearsed an ecumenism, an ecumenical initiative, which is called the United Nations of Faith. But I'll be giving a whole lecture on this issue. Buddhism, again, teaches divinity within, how to become one with the divine, and also teaches reincarnation. In fact, Buddhism... <laughs> It's just a sect of Hinduism, that's all it is. Well, here is the Dalai Lama. He is the present Lama. Of course, when he dies one day, they need a successor, right? And they can't wait for the Lama to reincarnate in a baby and let him grow up. They need a leader immediately. So, the next one is already incarnated. There he is, the next Dalai Lama. So the poor spirit of the Dalai Lama must be jumping constantly between these two. What a ridiculous teaching, and people buy this? And he's also, of course, a God King. This is from Time magazine. The Dalai Lama, Tibet's exile, God King. Just like the Pope is a God King. Who's he subject to, though? He's subject to the Pope because he bows down to him. And the Vatican and Buddhism are one and the same. A path to Nirvana emptying yourself until there's nothing left of you, paradise promised, light out of the east, and suddenly the world is flooded with these perverse little god-men. Here they are. Here's one of them. Rushira Avata Adida Samrash. He's God, by the way. Here he is. He only has hordes of women floating around him. And... Uh, here he is, photographed in 1993. Here he enters a room. Everybody falls flat. Suddenly the door at the front of the communion hall opened. The most exquisite, bright being I had ever seen entered. This was the one, capital, I had been waiting for. What does he say? He said, it is not enough to pursue realization as a relief from suffering. Realization must be that which certainly is not suffering. I am the avatar of brightness. The way of Adidam is not about seeking to be relieved of suffering. It is about happiness. It is about being in love with me. All as a condition of taking refuge in me are obliged to fall in love with me. I don't want to fall in love with that fat little guy, do you? Anyway, let's not be derogatory. Some people really believe that he is God. This here is Amrita Amanda Mayi Ama. Ama is her nickname. Now you think these people are just minor little figures walking around? Oh no. These are the dignitaries of the United Nations. 
he or she receives the award on the occasion of the Global Peace Initiative of Women, Religious and Spiritual Leaders in Geneva. And she's the spokesman at the United Nations. But you can worship her. She's God. You can worship her. That's fine. Amma's UN address. There is one truth that shines through all creation. Rivers and mountains, plants and animals, the sun, moon and stars, you and I. What is that? What's that called? Pantheism. That's correct. All are expressions of this one reality. It is by assimilating the truth in our lives and thus gaining a deeper understanding that we discover the inherent beauty, beauty in this diversity. When we work together as a global family, not merely belonging to a particular race, religion, nation, peace and happiness will once again prevail, blah, 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 blah. Tears, division, conflict will go away. It all sounds so nice. That's what the world wants to hear. But it's not biblical. Certainly not. This was the Avatar Mehe Baba. What do you notice about their names? Bab, 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 Bab. What does Bab mean? Do you remember? Gate, Gate, Bab El, Gate to El, God. Babel, this is Babylon in the making. The Dalai Lama is a God man. This man is the founder of the Hare Krishna movement. He calls himself. The, his divine grace. Isn't that nice? I always have trouble with his name. Bakshi Devantata Swami Prababa Pubdada. Whatever. And there are some of his temples. You can go in there. There he sits enshrined in every temple in the world. And these poor Hare Krishna kids run around with their shaven heads and their music and their flowers and worship this little God man over here. And uh, in all their paintings, you will find 12 around one, 12 around one. Here you have 12 vestal virgins around the one. Satan wants to copy Jesus in everything, doesn't he? Jesus had 12 disciples around one. There were 12 tribes of, you, uh, of Israel around Yahweh. Satan is just a lousy copy of the original. And he'll never get any better than being a lousy copy. Well, if you want to become a Hare Krishna, you have to be poor, unless you're George Harrison or one of the Beatles or one of that, then you can be rich. I need your money too, you see. Well, here was the original Sai Baba, but he died. But relax, he is reincarnated. You can have him back. Uh, here is Swami Direndra, all the, uh, the presidents, the high officials of India, they, Indira Gandhi, this was her personal guru. Uh, he was more like a, like a, whatever, bodybuilding god. And then his holiness, Maharashi Mahesh Yogi. What this holiness has to say is so unholy, I'll put it on the screen in a later lecture. He has nothing but murder in his mind. Social service. Observed to the United Nations Day, there's the Baha'i Faith. The Baha'i Faith has the largest representation in the United Nations. 800 full-time members. That's the largest of all the churches in the world. Who controls them behind the scenes is, of course, another story. Well, here is the founder. I find it so fascinating that the Baha'i Faith was founded in 1844. You know, this date keeps cropping up. It's such a fascinating date. And this here is the Baha'u Allah, linking the faith with the Baha'i faith, founded by the Bab, meaning the gates. There you go. Here we have all these gates leading to heaven. And uh, there is his son. Now, this is fortunately the reincarnation of uh, the Bab, the original Sai Baba. And so we have Sri Satai Sai Baba Ashram Puttaparthi, and he calls himself Almighty God. Uh, this one particularly irritates me, so I really have to control myself. And here he appears with his little flower, and he comes along with a gold car, and he is at this shrine where he has all the major religions coming together. There have been so many issues around this man that are, well, it's just disgusting. Let's not even talk about him. But this man is God. And all over the world, people worship him. There's a German fellow, 
kneeling in front or sitting in front of a shrine of Sai Baba. You know, sometimes I've wondered, what's happened to this nation of my birth? I would like to take these people and shake them and say, have you forgotten the Reformation? Have you forgotten what people were willing to die for? Here I stand and I can do no other. Jesus Christ is central in our religion. And now they go and take someone who looks like a, I don't know, like a what, a mop that's gone static or something, and they worship it? Isn't this crazy? Well, who controls these religions? Look at this. Jesuit swamis. The swamis, many of them, are nothing other but Jesuits. Here are the Jesuit swamis that drop the, the, the dress, diet, and customs of the local Lingayats and Belgium just districts. And there they are as swamis. There they are as Jesuits. They're Jesuits. Because in the Jesuit religion, you become all things to all men, and you control everything behind the scenes. This one over here, he recently died. He was Bhagwan Shri Rajneet Osho. There he is, a God-man. And people worshipped him. He had 50 Rolls Royces. And the crowds went crazy over him. Just listen to what they have to say about these people. I just met Bhagwan and there it was. It's nobody else than him. Bhagwan is my master and I love him. I'm in love with him. That's the only thing I can say. Rolls Royces two or three times a day and is worshipped, literally adored by his thousands of Western followers. It is so saddening to see their devotion for a mere human being who considers himself God and their submission to his spiritual rules like wearing his picture around their neck continually or wearing various shades of red always or changing their names to Indian ones. The generosity. No one in his right mind would not know that this is a walking, talking, living For God the Hindu, on earth. The Guru is all important. The Guru is his Lord, his Master, his Savior, even greater than God. I was really interested in their worship and their veneration and their adoration and the gifts and offerings they brought to me. But I was certainly not interested in their problems and their difficulties and hardships and pains. The Guru followers believe that he returns this incredible love that they feel towards him. But in reality, he feeds off their emotions to maintain his own they ego. They too are seeking the wisdom, the love that Bhagwan has to offer. He has so much love and he gives his love to everybody and it helps us to, to find our love in ourselves. Well, here are some pictures of these. Thousands of seekers, most of them from broken or unstable families and already emotionally wounded, are becoming victims of the gurus. Most of the gurus that I know of in the West are super rich. Gurus are more interested in white disciples than in Indian disciples, largely because they get more money from the whites. They have acquired vast land holdings, armed bodyguards, and outrageous luxuries from posh hotels to their own fleets of planes, helicopters, and as in Rajneesh's case. Well, I don't know whether you got that, but can you see the magnitude how these people worship these? That's just one of them, besides all the others. Ken Wilder, a New Age psychologist, says the great goddess Kali of India, when viewed in her highest form as the wife of Shiva, is a perfect example of the assimilation of the great mother image into new and higher corpus of great goddess mythology, which serves as actual sacrifice in awareness, not substitute sacrifice in blood. They hate Jesus. They hate him. The fall was an evolutionary advance, perfect growth, isn't that interesting? Yes. What else do they say? By eating from the tree of knowledge, not only did men and women realize they're already mortal in finite state, they realized they had to leave Eden subconscious 
and begin the actual life of true self. They did not get thrown out of the Garden of Eden. They grew up and walked out. Incident, incidentally, for this courageous act, we have to thank Eve, not blame her. That's the same teaching as the Mormon teaching. Exactly the same. This book here is The Coming of the Cosmic Christ, and the author is Matthew Fox. Who's Matthew Fox? A Roman Catholic priest who has become an Episcopal priest. It's interchangeable. It's exactly the same thing. This book is about the sacred, and our response to, the rev to it, reverence, the sacred what? The sacred everything, sacred creation, stars, galaxies, whales, soil. What's that? Pantheism. What else does he say? What creature dare deny that it is immortal diamond, an original blessing, an image of the Divine One? It is my experience that only the human species dare to deny its divinity, dares to deny the cosmic Christ. Same dribble, this is a Roman Catholic priest. If my thesis is correct that it is time to move from the quest for the historical Jesus to the quest for the cosmic Christ, this would help to diffuse the distorted religion and pseudo-mystical movement of our time, popularly known as fundamentalism and also called Christofascism. Well, who else said that these people are the new fascists? Isn't that interesting? So those that believe the Bible are Christofascists, and if you believe in this cosmic Christ, then you are fine. He says, perhaps we need a new ecumenical council will be forthcoming. This one would be deeply ecumenical and would call forth the wisdom of all the world's religions. Now, don't think Matthew Fox is a small fry. He's one of the great thinkers in the movement. And what will this cosmic Christ do? What will he make? He will make us change culturally or change our ways. Will lead us to deep sexuality. Hello? This is interesting. And what else will he do? The Eucharist, there's a promise of matern maternal eros in this. This is the old sex cult of Isis. It's sick. The one of the main features of the New Age movement is to prepare the world for the coming of the cosmic Christ, the reappearance of the Christ. And of course, the mind must be attuned to occultism. That's where Harry Potter and all these things come in. Notice the hand signs of Mary Grand Prix. She's the artist who paints for the movies and who also painted the set for the ant and all of that. J.K. Rowling is the authoress. Do you know that the names used in there are actual names of demons? Real names? And that they, she uses the sublime method of contamination, scrambling of words. For example, one of her characters is called Vlablatsky instead of Blavatsky. So this is occultism at its highest level, and we are told that this has values. This has nothing but satanic values. One of the most quoted supporters of the Potter books is Christianity Today. That was Billy Graham's magazine. And uh, they say Harry and his friends develop courage, loyalty, and willingness to sacrifice for one another. Not bad lessons in a self-centered world, but they have the symbol of Zeus on them. Well, what does the New Age wants to do? It wants to alter the state of consciousness, bring in dreams and visions, astrology, divination, spiritism, magic, spells, occult charms, solstice, human sacrifices, sacred sex, and serpent worship. That's basically what they want. And how will they go about it? Present it in a more palatable form, dismantle a student's previous beliefs, blend new beliefs, redefine words, rewrite history, provide mystical experiences, immerse students in enticing forms of new belief, use target beliefs to answer questions and demand purity. As long as you demand purity, everything's fine. The great initiates, this is what they supposedly looked like, the Master Maroya, the Venetian Master, the great nine ones that came again, the Master Hilarion, the Master St. Paul, supposedly one of the reincarnations, Serapsis, which means Seraphim, angelic form, Maha Chan, and then the Master Jesus, which, of course, was overshadowed by the Christ. Pathetic. All the other masters are masters in their own right, but when it comes to Jesus, he's overshadowed. Isn't it interesting how they changed the Bible to say, instead of the Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, showing that Jesus in the Bible was also controlled by someone else? Well, and then the great Master Kuthumi Lal Singh, and then the Matreya, the one that everyone is waiting for, the Christ, the Bodhisattva, the Inman Mahdi, the Sri Krishna, the St. Patrick, 
and the world teacher. Now, his agent or channel in the world today is Benjamin Cream. And Benjamin Cream is a British artist and longtime student of esoteric philosophy, has become the principal source of information about the emergence of Maitreya. Born in Glasgow in 1922, Benjamin Cream began studying art at an early age and he became an accomplished painter and a modernist style. His webpage, if you like, uh, is very, very interesting. Uh, Share International is the name. And of course it has many, many links to white Catholic sites. This is just another Jesuit as far as I'm concerned. Benjamin Cream, Reappearance of the Christ and the Modern Masters of Wisdom, 1982, his Tara Center organization uh, took a full page advertised advertisement and said Christ is now here. And he says, revitalize Christian churches as well as Masonic lodges will be used for purposes of giving mass planetary initiation. So the churches will work together. Share with your brothers this joyful expectation and tell them Matreya, their friend, their brother, and teacher of old, has come. Let's watch this video and see what he has to say. Good evening, my dear friends. Be ready to see me soon, to follow my thoughts, my advent is nigh. The world teacher for the New Age of Aquarius, Maitreya Buddha, has been living in London, England, since 1977. The Buddha, 2,500 years ago, made a prophecy that at this time would come into the world another great Buddha, Buddha like himself by name Maitreya, who would inspire humanity to create a brilliant golden civilization based, as he put it, on righteousness and truth. And that's what Maitreya has come to do. Think calm, tension between the eyebrows. He's a member of the Asian community of London. He lives there as an apparently ordinary man, although those are now around him know him as a very exceptional man. Everything I hear, he hears. He can teach through me, he can, he can uh, inspire, he can uh, heal, and, and so on. So he has a kind of vehicle, like a window in the world, through whom he can work. He told me to get a tape recorder, which I did, a little Grundig portable, and he began to give me long dictations, which I repeated under the microphone. And one night, three months after the initial contact, I heard the voice of Maitreya, and he said very little, it was very simple. He said, I myself am coming. It will be the most extraordinary evolutionary step which humanity will take. We can either accept the principle of sharing or else destroy life. The, the tensions inherent in the discrepancy in living standards between the developed world and the third world are such as they have within them the seeds of a third world war. That would be nuclear and would destroy all life, human and subhuman. But we have to make the choice. We have to invite him, we have to invite him forward and to come onto the radio and television networks of the world. And on the day of declaration, it will be the most extraordinary experience for humanity. We will see his face on the television screens, wherever you have access to television. But he won't speak, he won't say anything. But his thoughts and his ideas will enter telepathically into the minds of all humanity. He will come into mental telepathic contact with the whole of humanity simultaneously. See the light which beckons you into the future. Or sound forever the knell of regret. Don't you hate that type of voice? See the light that beckons you into the future, or forever sound the knell of regret. How pathetic, isn't it? He's going to appear on all the television screens, communicate telepathically with everyone, and everybody will know that they have to rally around him or else, and the principle of sharing, redistribution of wealth will be accepted. All these things we've been speaking about. 
This is nothing other than plain Roman Catholicism being taught in a New Age form. The reappearance of the, the masters of wisdom, Maitreya's mission, all these things. In 1977, he was asked, have you anything to say about the Holy Father in Rome? And he says, the master of Jesus will take over the throne of St. Peter in Rome. This event is now imminent. Then he said in 1979, the decease of Pope Paul VI and the sudden death of Pope John Paul one month, after, as month later as pontiff makes it more than likely that the present Pope John Paul II will be the last. Same as the Marian equivalents. Message number 53, he says, the law of God, I am, I am. And his priorities establish peace, inauguration of a system of sharing, removal of guilt and fear, education of mankind, introduction of the mysteries, beautification of all cities, removal of all barriers of travel, and creation of a pool of knowledge accessible to all. Sounds so nice. Adequate supply of food, adequate housing. Of course he doesn't say there that this housing will have to be shared. Health care and education, achieving, maintaining ecological balance, social, political justice for all. And he says that the God in man shines forth. Within you all sits a divine being. Is this God language or serpent language? He speaks like the devil. What else does he say? Theology is usually useless and argument over scripture is wasteful energy. Simply take the theme of loving and live it. Live it. He doesn't like the Bible, that's for sure. He says, I ask you to accept this new level of understanding. If you cling to every phrase of the Bible and argue its interpretation, you miss the point of God's message. Think of this force. The force be with you. He talks about the facts of the Christ, the facts of the hierarchy, very tight time schedule, time between now and the reappearance of the Christ is short. Learn the great invocation. No, Satan is saying, I'm coming soon. But when we say, Jesus says, I'm coming soon, then the world says what? Oh no, not for a long time. There's the great invocation. I will not read this silly little prayer of theirs. Without sharing, there can be no justice. Without justice, there can be no peace. Without peace, there can be no future. And then mysterious crosses started appearing in the sky, and then suddenly he appeared one day. Well, there he was. In 1988, who was there to film him? CNN. Of course, the owners of CNN, Ted Turner, was a 33-degree Freemason, so who would expect anyone else to photograph him? And there he appeared. That is his symbol. That is his symbol. It's totally occult. You've got the swastikas. You've got the, the uh, star and the moon and the crosses and the unification of all the religions. As he appeared in 1988, he healed all the people. He had the hyssop in his hand and thousands bowed down before him and worshipped him as God. And then CNN says he disappeared into the sky like a mystic. Then he appeared on television. Television screens switched themselves on in the United States in some eras and in Australia. Jesus stars on American television. Hundreds of TV viewers claimed to have seen him. His 1998 appearances were in Cyprus, Iceland, Argentina, Russia, Mexico, all over the world. Austria, Canada. Whoa, did you know that? March 1st in Toronto. Blanca, Mello, Oregon, USA. His 1999 appearances in Croatia, where he appeared to 100 people, Christians in that case, in China to Muslims, in Poland to Christians, then to Muslims, fundamentalist Christians, 500 saw him, 150, 150, there you go, the numbers of all that saw him. Turkey he appeared to Christians, in Morocco to Muslims. In 2001, he appeared in Argentina, Brazil, India, Poland, China, New Zealand, Pentagon. Do you know about all these things, all these appearances? In Mexico, he appeared in a stadium, and 35,000 people bowed down and worshipped him as Jesus Christ. Interesting. 150, 400, 150, 200. Then, in 2002, he appeared in Paraguay on the 24th of December to 200 Christians. And Share International has no information on its appearances after this date. The second coming of Christ, we will deal with this, is supposed to be, says the Bible, with power and great glory. And it will be coming in the clouds to punish those who refuse to know God, to redeem God's people. 
He comes with his angels like lightning that shines from the east to the west. All eyes will see him. There will be a resurrection. Jesus will come and every eye will see him, says the Bible. He won't appear on television and speak to you through mind control. There's no such thing in the Bible. This is the false one who will come, but Jesus Christ will come with the clouds of heaven. All eyes will see him. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Revelation 22, verse 20. He which testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. I hope that the world can be warned not to be duped into believing in these false messiahs, these false teachers who set them up selves up as gods while they live the most licentious lives on this planet, while they live in luxury and splendor and then propagate all these things. I hope the world can be warned to realize that the Bible is their only hope. This total onslaught on Jesus Christ and Him as Savior must be exposed, and may God help us to do it. Amen.